Hello everybody, my name is AJ and welcome to the Skill Billy Syndicate channel. Hello and welcome back everybody to part 3 of the video series. Today we are going to be talking about fuel lines, specifically what our options are as far as installing them with the Holly Sniper. Last video I was talking about what I was going to use for my fuel lines. I went ahead and used what is called PTFE or just Teflon. There's a Teflon core and then it's a stainless steel braided outside. From what I understand, this is impervious to gasoline, oils, ethanol, E85, high octane fuels, 91, 93, whatever. I also bought the 10 piece fittings. Now these are dash six AN style fittings on the end here, but that is not the same as the typical ones that you see where they use the rubber fuel line. This will not work with those. That rubber hose will not work with this. So make sure that you have the proper fittings if you decide to use the Teflon fuel line. This has a ferrule or what some people call a pearl or some people call an olive. It goes over this little dowel here, I guess. And what you do, when you push the Teflon fuel hose through there, what you want to do is you want to get the Teflon under this olive and then the steel braid on top of the olive. There's a little ridge in here. It's kind of hard to see on camera. And the idea is to get this Teflon piece flush up against there to make sure that you have a nice even cut when you cut this. I use my Dremel tool. It's kind of my go-to when it comes to cutting or shaping anything. Definitely worth the money I spent on it. A secret I learned or that I've seen other people do, wrap masking tape around the spot that you're going to cut and you just trim it off and it keeps this stainless steel braid from unraveling and fraying out. You want to fray a little bit, especially if you're going to push it over like a nipple style fitting and use a hose clamp to clamp it down. You're going to want to let that stainless steel fray out a little bit so you can work that fitting into there. But I'll talk about that more later on. Another option is I've seen people talk about where they thought they might be able to use nylon air brake line. This is SAE J844 Type B 3A's outside diameter. What this is, is there is a nylon core on here and then some kind of a plastic, whatever you want to call it, on the outside. From what I understand, this is resistant to oil, gases, E85, ethanol fuel, unleaded gasoline, pretty much whatever fuel you'd run in your truck. This is resistant to that, but it is not. 100% impervious to it the way the Teflon is. Another thing is that since this is a 3 8 outside diameter and not a 3 8 inside diameter, it's not much bigger than the stock 5 16 fuel lines that you would already have on your truck anyways. I wouldn't go through the trouble of buying something that you may have to replace later on down the road and it's not going to be much better than what's already in your truck stock. If it was me, I would probably just leave the 5 16 steel fuel lines in my truck and use those rather than go through the hassle of converting everything over. One reason though I can tell you that this looks attractive as far as using this nylon air brake line is if you've seen these fittings they have now these like push to connect fittings they have these at local auto parts stores now. I've seen several at my local O'Reilly's, Napa, Advance, Pep Boys, AutoZone. Using these would be really easy. The hose is flexible, easy to route. I could see why somebody would want to use this. Personally I just wouldn't take the chance. I'd rather just do it right the first time and not have to do it again. I heard of people using this. This is just a small piece of 3 8 brake line. They cut off the flare end, use a tube bender, and use this for their fuel lines. It is cheaper, I guess, what actual fuel line would be by the foot considerably cheaper. I don't know much about using it and I didn't do any research on it. In the start of this video I guess I said that we would explore what kind of options we had but really I don't think that this brake line and nylon air brake is really viable options. So if you're wanting to do things the right way or at least the less janky way. The only two options you really have are the Teflon braided line, the rubber high pressure hose like this one here. This is a section out of the 20 feet that Holly provides with their master kit. It has the SAE 30R rating. From what I understand, this is just a standardized rating that they use uh, for you know high pressure fuel injection fuel hose. Again, this is a piece of the 20 feet that Holly provides with their master kit. Um, I do want to say that Holly does provide this for the return fuel. They do recommend that if you're going to use any lines underneath the truck along the frame rail, they recommend that you do use solid steel lines or any kind of a hard line to prevent any kind of road hazards. Anyways, I use this for my return fuel. 
since they provided 20 feet of it i took advantage and used it and i had only ordered 16 feet of the teflon this should only see between 7 and 8 psi so nothing real high pressure i think i probably could have got away with just using regular 3 8 inside diameter fuel hose that wasn't a high pressure rating but like i said they provided it so i used it so i use this for the return i use this for the primary feed here in a little bit we'll actually go under the truck and i will show you how i routed everything and got that set up uh, another thing that holly provided when they want you to set up your return fuel system they give you this this is made for fuel and this is what they give you for your return fuel line so they want you to drill a 9 through your fuel sending unit if you can if you can't they say to do it in your actual fuel tank but they also say if you do drill in your fuel tank they recommend that you get it uh, removed filled with water and professionally cleaned out to get any metal shavings out of there and stuff anyways uh, this is a 9 16 hole they give you a couple of fittings that bolt onto here there's a, an elbow on the top it's a dash 6 an fitting and there's just a regular male barb that comes off of here and this line goes over that it secures it down with the hose clamp and this is just where your return fuel would come back into the tank um, so this is my stock sending unit and I already have the one that I modified in there so this one here is a backup I also used it to drill my first hole and kind of get an idea of what I was going to do with the return fuel line what I did do on the sending unit I have in my truck I bought a new one and used that since I had everything apart there's no point in using used parts if you can help it I used my Dremel tool and I cut off my fuel line here and then also here and what I did was I used that 9 hole saw and I actually offset a little bit to where I caught just this outside edge here and kind of moved my hole further over this way rather than drilling through the center and the reason I did that was to put more of a distance between the hole for the return line and for my primary feed because when you install these with the parts on the master kit the fitting they give you has a large nut on there maybe it's like a 7 8 or a 3 quarter inch size nut that goes on there and that butts up against a special sealed washer it looks like a transmission line washer it's got the rubber on the inside and it's a metal washer on the outside and your fitting goes through there and it's got a big old nut on there and you tighten that from the bottom and then you add that little barb fitting and then put your lines in how you want anyways that three quarter inch or seven eighths nut on there takes up a lot of room especially if you have two next to each other so you want to make sure that you get some distance between these two holes that you drill out so that's what I did on mine like I mentioned, this line here is provided with the master kit. This is for the return fuel. And there's a barb fitting that this slides over and then you use a hose clamp. What I did is I ordered an extra elbow from Summit Racing. And it's the same as what came in the holiday kit. I did the exact same thing as they recommend doing for the return fuel line. And I did it for the feed. Only difference is instead of using this corrugated fuel line for my feed line, what I did was I used the stainless steel braid with a Teflon core. So what I did was I measured the total distance of this fuel line here. I cut a piece of my Teflon fuel line the same distance and I had attached that up to here. The same way that this corrugated fuel line attached. I used a barb style fitting and a hose clamp. I just laid down the fuel line in the bottom of the tank so it kind of sets in there and it's submerged in fuel. So that's how I did mine. I'm sure there's better ways to do it, but again, this isn't a tutorial telling you how to do yours. It's just documenting how I did mine. So that is the fuel system. I know there's not any awesome video to it since I didn't record much of that process, but it was really boring. I think a lot of this stuff is just super basic. If there's any questions, you guys can ask me and I'm more than happy to answer or talk about it. Uh, once this was done, I dropped this into my fuel tank. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can try to explain this a little bit better so you guys can understand exactly what I did with my fuel system. This is the return line. This is the rubber hose that Holly provided with the master kit. This here is a regular dash six AN fitting. It's a female end, threads right onto this elbow here. On this hose part here, it's clamped down to a piece just like this. I call it a barb fitting. I know it's not really the barb style with the ridges on it, but this is what I mean. It's just like this, but it's a three ace. That threads onto this elbow. There's these two little washers. These are the ones I was talking about earlier that I said look like transmission washers. There's a rubber core in the middle and then just a steel washer on the outside and it's uh, zinc coated to keep it from rusting and stuff. There's one on top and there's one on the bottom. Underneath here, 
there is that large 7 eighths or 3 quarter nut that threads onto the elbow and that holds, you know, kind of sandwiches everything together and holds it onto the top of the sending unit. And then there's another one of these fittings on the inside of the tank and that's where the, that corrugated fuel line goes and it just hangs in there, almost touches the bottom and that's for the return fuel line. All the pieces for the feed line are exactly the same as what I covered on the return line. Only difference is, is instead of using the rubber fuel line, I used the Teflon braided line. And on the inside of the tank, instead of using that corrugated fuel line that Holly provided, I used the Teflon fuel line with the braid. On the inside here, I measured that metal hard line from the stock fuel sending unit. Cut a piece of the Teflon fuel line, the same length. I attached the fuel line inside the sending unit the same way this is. And at the end of it, I put a fitting so there wouldn't be little pieces of the stainless steel just fraying all the way out. That aluminum fitting just sets in there at the bottom of the tank. It kind of keeps it off the bottom. I completely cleaned out my tank before I put any of this in there. Um, drained all the fuel on it. Wiped it all down. It was immaculate in there. So there's nothing in the bottom that this is going to suck up. At least not in the immediate future. Really basic stuff. I'm sorry I wasn't able to video it all. When I'm working on this and then trying to film it, it really slows down the process. And some days I only get an hour or two in here and I'm really more focused on getting the work done and explaining it later on when I have more time rather than just not getting anything done and then trying to explain it as I go. So I apologize for not providing that video. I'll try to do better with that in the future. So this is how the fuel sending unit is set up. Another thing that I had done while I was in here is again, as I checked these fuel lines here, uh, mine are still in really good shape. What this line here is for is this is actually for the rollover. So if you're ever in an accident, your vehicle rolls over, it goes to this emergency rollover vent or shutoff or valve, whatever you want to call it. This here is the actual vent tube for your fuel tank. You guys know when it gets hot outside, fuel expands, it starts to vaporize more and pressure builds up inside the tank. This vents those gases out and away from the tank. I blew air through here and through here to make sure these lines were clear and also to make sure that the valve was working properly. So I blew air into here and made sure that I could hear it release. When this gets up to a certain pressure, this vent tube here should be releasing air through it. So I just took my air chuck, blew into here, and that's what it did. I plugged up this line and blew in here again. And what I did was I wanted to make sure that my vented gas cap was working. When you blow air into there, you can hear this, not really a click, but you hear the diaphragm move and you can hear the air seeping out of here. So this is a vented fuel gas cap on top of the factory vent and then the rollover valve. I kept all those intact. I did replace this hose here for the fuel filler neck. Mine was just really dried and kind of cracked in really rough shape. So I did replace this. Um, what else? Oh, so I had the steel fuel lines. You know, they come up to here, the factory fuel lines. And I used to have a problem where I would fill my gas tank up and sometimes it would spit fuel back at me if I filled it up too fast. So I knew that my tank wasn't venting properly before. What I ended up doing was I blew air through the, the feed line and the return line. Both were clear, no problem there. I took my air chuck and I blew some air through that quarter inch steel line where the vent hose was attached to normally. What I found out is there was a major restriction in that line and there was rust and all kinds of nasty crap in there. So I was glad that I checked that out. You guys should probably check those things out. If you come this far, it doesn't really hurt to replace a couple hoses. Make sure your hoses are clear, free of debris, stuff like that. Another thing I did off camera was I removed my stock fuel lines. Really easy. You just disconnect all your rubber hoses here. And then I went under the truck and in about two to three foot sections, I took my metal cutters or tin snips, whatever you want to call them. And I'd cut the fuel line and remove them from their brackets. And I'll show you guys what those brackets look like. So. Uh, back to these brackets. These are the fuel line brackets that your truck should have. These bolt in right along the frame rail. This little screw comes out and this metal piece slides off and this just holds your steel fuel lines into place. There's a 12 millimeter bolt right into the frame like this. 
the bolt holds us into place and your fuel lines run through there. So what I was doing was I would get just behind it to where I could reach pretty easily, use my 10 snips, cut the three fuel lines. You do want to make sure they're cleared and blew out. There's no more gas or anything flammable inside of them because if those 10 snips for whatever reason spark, I know it's not a very likely thing to happen, but you just never know. Crazier things have happened, I'm sure. But anyways, you just cut those fuel lines and then uh, remove these brackets completely and just pull the pieces out. And I did that in about two and three foot sections, depending on where I was at. Um, pretty straightforward. But uh, yeah, these are there. They're easy to remove. Um, I don't have much rust under my truck at all. Just light surface rusting and scaling. So nothing under my truck is really seized up horribly. I have one, two, three all together. There is one towards the front of the truck that's a little bit more of a booger to get to but even that one wasn't like you know it wasn't a horrible thing and I got to it pretty quickly so these are them cut your fuel lines use what you have next thing I want to show you guys before I go under the truck is I want to show you what I used to fasten the fuel line to the frame rail um, I use these rubber insulated steel cable holders or hose holders whatever you want to call them um, Got these, Home Depot again, and went ahead and got some of these self-drilling like sheet metal screws. Takes a little bit of force to push down on the screw to make sure that you're cutting through the steel on the frame rail, but it goes through pretty easily and I didn't have much trouble. When you route your fuel lines, you want to make sure you're keeping away from things that can rub on, anything that rub a hole through it. You got to think things are going to be moving, vibrating, uh, and just do your best and use your common sense on where to place these and how to place them. So let's go into the truck and I'll show you guys what I did. All right, guys, this is not, uh, not much room here, so I'm going to do my best to show you what I did. This is the fuel pump assembly, and you can see this is the post filter, the fuel pump, and the pre-filter here. This here is just a... Power line I have running to an auxiliary battery and I haven't put it up yet, so just ignore that best you can. Okay, so this here was the rubber insulator I put in and uh, you can see I kind of got it snugged up and away from everything. I did that one and then I used those same self-tapping screws that I used for the insulated brackets to hold in the fuel pump. They were a little bit more industrial than the ones that came with the actual fuel pump itself. This one here is probably the most unique uh, one I did. I had bent this up and used this bracket here to keep this hose centered through this hole here because I didn't want to come up over this cross member and cut off the fuel or restrict the fuel flow at a sharp angle since there wasn't much room. So I just went through this factory hole here and then I used this bracket to hold this uh, fuel line away from the edges so I wouldn't have to worry about it vibrating or um, you know rubbing on here and rubbing a hole through it. Uh, you can see here on the, the braided fuel line. So I just went right over that end on the fuel filter and just use the regular hose bracket. That's the in and this is the out here. Same thing. Um, when I did do these hose clamps on here, uh, you'll notice that these are all facing, sorry guys. If you look at these hose clamps here, you'll notice that these are all facing up. And this is for, in the future, I don't want to have to fight to access these hose clamps to remove them or change the filter. So, I orientated these to where I could access them pretty easily. This is actually one of the 12 millimeter bolts that hold on that factory fuel line bracket. And I ended up using this, cleaned up the metal around it, and used a ring terminal. That's actually my ground for my fuel pump. So it was nice to use that. I'm kind of OCD, so I replaced all of these bolts I took out from the factory. I did replace them and put them back just to make sure there's no water or anything else getting in there inside the frame. Uh, going further ahead. Oh, there ain't much room, boys. So you could you could want to see. Maybe you can't. Holy. So this is the fuel line going through that cross member. It goes over this cross member. And I kind of staggered between the rubber fuel line and the stainless steel braided fuel line and just routed these up through here and just kind of kept everything nice together, uh, neat and clean to where it's not going to be um, getting messed up. I did put these fuel lines pretty high on the frame rail because I don't want them hanging down. The truck's already low and I don't want any chance of hitting anything. These getting messed up or ripping open as that would not be a good time. Uh, you might be able to see further ahead here into the engine bay where I was able to uh, get some more of those brackets in there 
and I will show you that. This here is my airline. I actually run my airline through my frame rail to keep that from uh, getting hit with any road hazards or anything that might be in the middle of the road here. Let's go back top side and I'll show you some of the stuff we worked on. So top side here, you can see I got this bracket here and then there's a couple more uh, down there that we saw from underneath. And you can kind of get the idea of how this stainless steel line is pushed off of the frame. And I did that, I really wanted to make sure I could pay attention to where it's sitting at and just keep it away from as much stuff as possible. I placed this bracket here specifically to keep this fuel line raised up off this part of the frame rail, but also if you see right where it comes here by the motor mount, it just goes around this. I can get almost a full finger between the corner of the motor mount and the fuel line itself. And then that tension keeps this in place all the way up to the sniper. This is how the fuel line looks coming up into the sniper. And then of course, this is the return fuel line. When I routed this, I really just tried to keep it away from anything that I thought would cause me any problems in the future. I also use this section of line here kind of as a support to hold this rubber fuel line off of anything, you know, past that point because it gets into the A-arm here and I haven't put it in any wheel tubs yet. For those of you who are paying attention, you might recognize that I had added these PCV lines. Well, there's kind of an argument the other day on the Facebook page about what you call these. Um, I guess technically they're both PCV lines. I consider this the PCV line and this the breather hose. It doesn't matter what you call it as long as you have them hooked up correctly. There are provisions built into the sniper for brake booster, vacuum, PCV vacuum, vacuum advance, and those are all right here. This is for the vacuum advance. This will go to the distributor, obviously. The PCV hose I have going to what would normally be the brake booster vacuum, but I would called Summit and they said that this is perfectly fine to do that since it's after the injector, after the butterfly valves and everything. It's just a, a constant vacuum, so no problem there. This here is where my breather hose has always gone. I used to have a catch can on here and just until I get this thing tuned and running how I want, I took it out of the equation just to make sure Sure. I'm not troubleshooting for you know two months after finishing the installation. You might recognize this piece here if you have a Weber. This is what is normally inside the air filter or the air cleaner on your Weber and I use this little elbow because this hose here, the inside diameter is larger than the nipple or the connection piece on the intake manifold down here. So I needed to find a way to reduce that size. I just used this elbow on here, threaded it on here. You can see it's a pretty tight fit. There's not going to be a ton of vacuum through here anyways. I mean, uh, this is just pretty much catching any kind of oil vapor and then just bringing it right back in through the intake. I did do that off camera as well. I do have the throttle cable linkage set up. If you remember in the last video I talked about how I was waiting on some parts, the pieces for this throttle linkage was uh, one of the parts I was waiting for as well as this throttle bracket. Now the throttle bracket was supposed to come with the master kit, so hopefully you guys have this. There's also a bracket for your transmission kickdown cable if you're using one. Obviously it's a five speed, I'm not using one. So you can either use just the throttle bracket by itself or the throttle bracket with the kickdown cable bracket as well. Both of those are supposed to come in the master kit. Mine just didn't happen to have it for some reason. I had called Summit, they sent me those pieces and this is them. This was really easy. I just did a little bit of a bending on it in my vise. I used the stud here for the intake manifold and I used that as a mounting location. When you get into this realm of the build, it's really you figuring out what you're happy with and what works best for you. So what worked best for me might not work best for you depending on what kind of tools you have or uh, you, know, you might have access to a much larger shop or much bigger tools or better equipped tools for the job and you might figure out something way better than what I did. I just used what I had. I had gotten the bracket and kind of got a rough orientation of how I wanted to attach this bracket and route my throttle cable. And what I had done was is I put a little dab of grease on the stud for the intake manifold here and I had positioned this bracket in roughly the area where I thought I was going to need to place it and I pushed it up against that stud so once I took the bracket off there was a small dab of oil and then I could drill my hole based off of that. Had to trim up this back corner here to be able to slide this all the way over against the head. You got a bench grinder, a grinding wheel, angle grinder, and a vise, anything. Uh, I did it with my Dremel tool and took 
30 seconds and it was no problem. Once I did that, I had got a tape measure and measured from the center of where I was gonna attach my throttle cable over to where the bracket was. And it was about a, just about an inch, maybe an inch and an eighth. And so I knew how far I had to bend my bracket to make it reach to where I had a straight shot at the sniper linkage. Again, took this piece off, put it in my vise, and I bent it and then bent this piece up until it came over far enough to where this cable, there was no bind in it, and it was pretty much a straight shot to the, the sniper. Uh, you might notice that I did use a, uh, this is a piece off of a bicycle for the handbrake, and I used this as a safety precaution. It probably doesn't look like that, but what I had to do to be able to attach my stock throttle cable to the sniper was actually drill this hole out slightly larger and then grind a small slice in here so I could slide the cable through that and just like on the handbrake on the bicycle you can turn this and it goes straight up and down here and you can turn this little ferrule piece at the end here and get that slice to line up up and down and the cable will slide right out so what I did was I used this piece off the bicycle handbrake and you can see I kind of got this clocked over a little bit here and then the, the bottom piece here is also clocked over and what that does is I don't have to worry about this throttle cable just sliding out on its own so it adds a little bit of protection. Uh, another thing though is it adds uh, just enough play it seems like to where I can keep this throttle cable loose and still get full zero to 100% on the throttle position sensor. Uh, I can keep it right here for idle and this cable's loose. It's not pulling on anything. It's not, you know, revving it up or anything like that. Just like on the Weber, they tell you to keep this cable kind of loose. That's what I did for this. And with this handbrake piece on here, I'm able to keep this loose and I can still, when I put the, my pedal to the floor, it goes all the way to 100% here. That was a little bit of a trick. Getting the throttle cable just right it takes a little bit of finagling, but you can do it. I used a rubber mallet and banged on my bracket to bring it forwards more. And I'm talking like a sixteenth of an inch at a time and adjust that and going back and forth between hammering on this bracket and then going inside the truck and messing around with the gas pedal to get the full play of the throttle cable so I can go all the way to 100% and still be able to have it close all the way when you let it go. I do want to show you guys something inside the truck that you might have to adjust on yours to be able to get this to work properly. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here in just a second. So this is your gas pedal, obviously. Fold it all the way up to right there, that main stud there. There is a nut on the base of this bolt here. And what this does is it acts like a pedal stop so you don't stretch out your throttle cable. So what I had to do on mine was actually back the bolt out far enough to where I could press my pedal all the way to the floor and it not hit this bolt on here and I could get the rest of the movement I needed for the sniper. I also had to bend this up a little bit. Not much, I mean very little. Uh, I had to bend this up so I could push down further on the pedal itself. So I had to bend this up and then had to back this out. And then once I got it to where I needed it, I had to thread this back in just enough to where when I press it all the way to the floor, it stops the pedal from going any further than I need it to. And then you use that jam nut on there and tighten it back up. I had to do that. You guys might not have to do that, but uh, that's what I did. Out of all the work I've done the past week and everything I've covered so far in this video, I would have to say that adjusting this throttle cable to work with the full range of motion of the throttle linkage was probably the most, I'm not gonna say time consuming, but maybe the most tedious thing that I've worked on. Um, once the bracket was done, there's variables in here that you have to adjust. You wanna be able to have enough adjustment on this throttle stud here, or whatever you wanna call it, to where if this cable stretches over time, which it will, you wanna be able to have enough adjustment on here to back this out to compensate for that. You also want to, in the future, if you run into a bind somewhere, you wanna be able to maybe add some slack to it. And there's this very small window in the middle uh, to where when you hit the gas and just let go of the pedal, this thing snaps closed and you can hear that audible snap. You hear the butterfly valves snap shut on the sniper itself. And getting that and still being able to get the full range of motion at wide open throttle there is a middle ground there. Getting it to work simultaneously, it takes a little bit of doing, 
In theory, you could adjust this piece here, this piece here, and then of course what I showed you guys inside the truck with the gas pedal. This step in the process probably wouldn't have been so bad if I had somebody here to work with me, but uh, when you're going in and out of the truck, between pressing on the gas pedal yourself and listening for this to snap shut, and then making sure that you get the full 100% movement out of the throttle linkage, going back and forth takes time. One of the downfalls of working by yourself, but it's the way I prefer it. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. We're getting really close to being able to fire this up. The next big thing that we have to work on is going to be installing the O2 sensor. And I haven't decided if I'm going to use the O2 bung that came with my pace setter header when I bought it almost six, seven years ago, something like that. They got a spot there where you can just thread in an O2 sensor. So I'm not sure if I'm going to add this to my exhaust system and then just use the port on here for the O2 sensor or if I'm gonna use that adapter piece where you just drill a three quarter inch hole in your exhaust that you have now, and then just make sure it's tilted at about 10 degrees so you can get any fuel that accumulates on the O2 sensor will be able to drip off. Um, I haven't decided what I'm gonna do with that yet. Should be interesting, but we'll cover that in the next video. And I think uh, the video after that, we might be able to start this thing. Thanks everyone for watching. You guys have a great night.